Good morning. I hope everybody can hear me. It sounds like this mic is pretty strong. Um, but I'm going to stand over here so you can see me because I'm short and the podium is tall. <laughs> so um, first, before I get started talking about myself and Blue Spark and what we do in estimation and this talk, um, I just wanted to know a little bit about who you are and who's in the room today. So kind of by show of hands, uh, who here is a project manager? All right, lots of project managers, probably over half the room. Uh, any developers? All right, also a you know, good number. Anybody who's like an account manager, more on like the sales end of things? All right, so kind of scoping out projects maybe at first. Um, and anybody who just walked into this room hoping to hide in the back and check email? <laughs> no, hey, oh, one person, hey, you're honest. <laughs> And all right, so enough about you. I'll get into the, the quick bio part. Um, so my name is Ashley Tabenet. I am Chief Operating Officer at Blue Spark. Uh, I live in Chicago. I have two young kids. They're four and two years old. Um, they're super cute, but I did not put a photo up, so you'll just have to take my word for it. Um, so I began my career in advertising. I uh, worked at first uh, doing production of commercials and kind of, in a sense, project managing that process and you know getting uh, shoots going and things like that. Um, I had a bit of a change of heart and realized advertising wasn't for me. And I found a job working at a uh, French luxury jeweler uh, called Boucheron. At the time, I lived in France. I, was, I lived in Paris for 14 years. And so that is kind of where I got my, my start in the whole web world. I was their e-commerce manager for a couple of years. So I was dealing with, uh, you know, the back end and dealing with all the orders and uh, some of the customer service things, um, updating all of our products. So kind of more of like the admin client side that a lot of us probably deal with. Um, that site was actually built on Drupal 6 with a flash front end. So it was really great. I couldn't update anything myself. And so that's also how I got my start in the Drupal world. Um, so after a couple of years there, I, I had an opportunity to join BlueSpark as a project manager. And so I parted ways with Boucheron and went to BlueSpark. Um, I was project manager with BlueSpark for, I guess, five or six years before kind of transitioning into an operations role. So I've managed a lot of different projects, you know, big, small, really cool clients, really difficult ones. You know, also, I mean, as you manage projects, you deal with a whole lot of different situations and you kind of learn as you go. I'm sure a lot of you know that. Um, but now, mostly my job is kind of keeping the agency running and dealing with resourcing and projection and, and planning out uh, kind of our future work and, and keeping the team busy. Um, so, Blue Spark is a full service digital agency. We focus in Drupal. We also do some uh, WordPress, some Symphony work, uh, but we kind of do full project life cycles. So, you know, design, UX, and through development. Uh, we also offer support to some of our clients and, and things like that. Uh, we are a remote company, and we have been since our inception. So, our team uh, kind of spans the globe. We have people. Uh, from California to Hungary. So we deal with a lot of different time zones, a lot of Google Hangouts and things like that. Um, so this talk is how changing our estimation process took our project endgame from what the F to for the win. <laughs> and we're gonna talk about estimation. It's pretty important to most projects. Uh, we're gonna talk about how that process evolved in our agency, uh, how it came about, how to do it if you would like to implement this great process yourselves, and uh, the outcome of that change. So before I actually talk about estimation, though, let's talk about its precursor, which is budget. So this is obviously one of the three sides to our project management triangle of scope, budget, and timeline. And it's often, not always, but often, one of the most inflexible. It would be so great if all projects just had like the ideal budget. Every client who came to you was like, look, I just have endless piles of cash. This is what I want. This is my timeline. You can spend as much as you need to. Just get it done. 
but that's not really very, very realistic. Most clients do need to stick to a budget. So coming back to reality, you know, the truth is that a lot of organizations and companies who are you know, engaging in, in a large or small web development project, um, they've had, there's kind of been the whole process they went through before they came to you, where they have to obtain budget approval. So probably somebody within the organization who is involved with their website, um, you know, they felt a need, noticed a need for, for this project. They spent some time probably thinking about it, putting together their requirements, you know, having maybe some internal meetings and all of that. They put together a rough idea of the budget. Maybe they did that just by pulling a random number out of thin air. Maybe they did that by thinking back to previous projects. Maybe they talked to other people in similar roles. But they have a number, right, that they've already taken internally and uh, they've gotten that approved. So whatever that budget is that they set internally, you know, they have, it's been budgeted, the funds have been set aside and their project has then been given the green light to go out and, and look for vendors and that's generally where most of us come into play. So, you know, the money's already allocated and normally that actual budget is not endless piles of cash. But, you know, that's okay. There's plenty that can be done within any budget, you just need to be managing your client's expectations and scope accordingly. So where you can get into trouble though is when there's an RFP involved with a new project. <laughs> so RFPs uh, or requests for proposal, they usually do involve a pretty detailed list of requirements where you know, they're sending out this list of things that they want and they're telling you this is how much money we have and more or less a set timeline. So you're kind of, your project management triangle in an RFP, there's nothing that seems very flexible at that point. And we all know that something's got to give. You can't have it all with your project. So, you know, that makes sense though, because from the client's perspective, uh, their project plan needed to be mapped out in order to gain that internal approval that I was talking about. And in order to begin, you know, shopping it to, to potential vendors. You know, they can't just go around and get internal, internal approval saying like, it's gonna cost about this much. I think this is our timeline, but I don't really know what we're doing. Like, they're going to want to see all three sides of, of this project and what's going into it. But from a vendor's perspective, an RFP can kind of be a bit of a ticking time bomb. Because when you respond to an RFP, if you are providing a really detailed estimate, it can get you in hot water once your project starts. Uh, it is a great way to eat into your margins and even lose money on a project. And the reason for that is you know, when you respond to an RFP, you spend this time, you put together a proposal. Some of you who raised hands earlier are probably involved in this process. Um, I never was as a project manager. That was something that was also always done by like kind of our tech lead, UX and, and sales. And I kind of stepped in afterwards once the proposal had been accepted. Um, so, you know, you spend some time, put together the numbers, put it into a pro proposal, attach a budget, send it out. And so, you know, you've spent some time, you've thought about this all internally, but the real problem is, like, it's pretty much just a bunch of questions at this point. You don't actually know very much about this client. You've maybe had one or two meetings with them. They sent you, you know, an RFP that kind of explains their situation, kind of explains who they are, but you don't really know who you're dealing with. You haven't had the time to get to know these people, to know how they work, you know, do they tend to, do they tend to take, you know, two weeks to respond to every single email that you send them? Do they, you know, do they give you really quick responses? Do they respond but then change their mind the next day? Those are all things that, you're, that you learn about your client and that could, well, will have an impact on your budget as you go. So, you know, your estimate when you're responding to an RFP, it's just based on assumptions. And it could just be a bunch of question marks. I don't know, really, I really don't know how much time it will take to complete these things because you know, I don't know you. Um, so, you, you know, at this point you haven't had time to really assess their needs and put together any detailed specs and, you know, gain that understanding of, of this client and what they need and what you're trying to build for them. So it's kind of like, you know, if you're trying to build, uh, if you're trying to build a house, right, and you just tell the contractor, well, you know, 
I want a kitchen and a living room and three bedrooms and two bathrooms. Well, that could cost, you know, there's, there's a great range of, of pricing for, for a house like that. Um, it's definitely not the same as having detailed blueprints that you're bringing to a contractor so that they know the size of these rooms. And it's even not the same as having like detailed comps where they know like what kind of tile are you putting in and the light fixtures and things like that. So, you know, when you just have an RFP with a bullet list of items, but you don't have wireframes, you don't have comps, you don't have interaction requirements, you don't know how much it's going to cost. So as a project evolves and it becomes more defined and you get all of those all of those project details, um, that's, at that point you have to revise your budget. And that's kind of what the process that we evolved is about. So unfortunately, I kind of learned that the hard way. Uh, so here's how not to manage a fixed bid project. And I only did this once, I swear. I never messed up on any other project besides this one. Uh, so we had this case where a client came to us with an RFP. And they had so many things that they wanted in this RFP. And so the, it included like a really long list. They had user login, event management, application process, event ticketing, blah, 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 blah. It was very long. They wanted all the things. And they had a tight budget. And of course, they had a tight timeline. So you know, we met with this client. We explained to them, you know, this is great. But within your budget and with this timeline, we're probably going to have to take this feature list and we're going to have to define some phases. And we'll work on phase one now. You'll get that for your first timeline. These are the features that you really need. It, this site was around an event. So they needed specific things to be able to do their first year's event. But then for the next year's event, they could have additional features. So phase one will be what you need for this year. Phase two for next year. Work that all out with them. And so you know, we moved some of those items to later phases. And they were all on board with this, happy with this, until we got about to the end of phase one. And we were on time, on budget. I was like super happy telling my client, look, look at this great site that we have and it's ready to launch and we're on time, on budget. And they're like, well, but you spent our entire budget. Well, yes, that is what we explained <laughs> when we phased things out was that we were going to work on phase one with this budget and when more funds were available next year, we'd work on phase two. So we had a bit of a, a rude awakening when they became upset and there had obviously been some miscommunication there. Uh, their expectations really hadn't been managed. So in the end, that project was, it was a failure. We didn't continue working with that client after phase one. Um, and you know, their, like I said, their expectations weren't well managed and so that, that's not a successful project. When your client's unhappy at the end, even though you've delivered what you thought was your approved you know, scope on time and on budget, then something went wrong. So after that, we looked at, our, at that situation. We did kind of a retrospective and we were like, we can do better. Let's, you know, we're smart people. Let's sit down, let's put our heads together. Let's fix our process. Um, so we, you know, we're trying to figure out how can we better manage client expectations, and budget, so that this type of situation doesn't happen again. And so we just basically asked us ourselves, how could we do a better job of being accurate with our estimates? And there, the solution that we came up with was to integrate estimate revisions at key points in our process. So we do one estimate revision uh, right at the end of project discovery, so as we've known, as we've gotten to know some about this client, but not quite everything yet. And then uh, we do a second estimate revision when we get to the end of the UX and design phase. Uh, so we kind of define those two milestones as the times when it needs to happen. And I'll go into more detail about this next. But the other question that we asked ourselves was how could we do a better job of explaining the effect that decisions made in the design process have on the overall project budget and scope. It seems that a lot of clients, when you're in you know, discovery and design, they want all the things because at this point, they're just kind of on paper. There's at not actual development hours going towards them, so it seems like their budget can stretch much further than it actually can. And so our solution there was, it was pretty clear to us that we just, we need to be more transparent. So we changed our process to explain to clients before, during, and after projects 
uh, where their money is going. So we're very transparent with all of this. Um, in our proposals, our entire process is explained. It's very clear that our estimates, uh, you know, in the proposal are essentially guesses and that it's going to be revised. We explain at what point it will be revised and what goes into those revisions. Uh, we also explain uh, all of, the, we, we go through that process like in our kickoff and uh, kind of continually when we're leading, when we're getting into each milestone, we'll explain here's what's going to happen next, here's we're going to revise it again, here's why, here's what will happen. So trying to really manage their expectations and get them to understand uh, our process and, and what each step is and why it's important for them and for, for their budget. Um, we also, going back to the transparency part, um, all of our time logs are visible to our clients in JIRA so they can see at any point like where time is being logged, on which tickets, by whom, what they did. Um, and then we also do, you know, when, once we're into development, we're doing uh, budget updates, of course, on like a weekly basis and, and sharing that with them so they know what's happening. Um, are we hitting our estimates? Are we off? It's, it's all very open. Um, so anyway, we try to really take every opportunity we can to explain the process and really involve the client in it so they always know what's happening and how the decisions that they make impact their overall project. So, so we ended up then, you know, redefining our estimation process and we incorporated the two estimate revisions and we worked to increase our transparency. So then, how does this whole process work? How, how could you, you know, implement the same revisions, the same estimate revisions if you were interested? Essentially, we start off, as many of you probably do, with a kickoff meeting for our projects. So in our client kickoffs, we always uh, include the entire project team. Sometimes uh, I may not know exactly which developers will be used on the project at that time, but I try to include everybody who I'm sure will be on the project. Definitely the tech lead, UX, design, the project manager, um, whoever was involved in sales on the project as, as well, we would all be in that meeting uh, with the client. We prepare that meeting in advance, so reviewing the RFP, reviewing the proposal, going over any questions that we have on things that are, that are in that. And so in our kickoff meeting, we, uh, we review our process with them. So as I said, we, we explain this process to them. It's a, it's a continual thing uh, throughout the course of the project. Um, we discuss the different project milestones. We discuss um, scope definition and how their decisions will play into that. Um, we kind of work with them to try and determine an MVP. So, you know, what really the minimum features are that they need to get to launch so we understand really where their priorities lie. And so we discuss with them at what point the budget and estimates will be, will be updated. Um, and then we kind of get into our discovery questions. So we have a bunch of questions that we go through with clients where we aim to understand what their pain, po pain points are and what, what they're trying to accomplish with this new project. So we're trying to kind of really get their business needs out of them and uh, not understand what they want but what they need because it isn't always the same thing. Sometimes they think that they need certain features that they really don't. So after our kickoff, we then get into our discovery, pro or into our discovery process with uh, UX sketches. So we do kind of a series of client discovery meetings uh, with any of the key client stakeholders, your, our uh, UX designer and the project manager. Um, so essentially in these we kind of do rapid iterative design. So it's kind of fast paced and the point is to get very rough sketches in front of the client as quickly as we can in these initial discussions. So we're trying to just get things laid out very roughly and see, you know, if, if this is really what they're looking for. Is this the right direction or does this need to be over here or maybe on another page or maybe that feature just doesn't make sense at all. We're just trying to discuss these things but get a visual representation of, of what we're, we're talking about um, as we go through discovery. Um, so we sketch things out and as I said, it's rapid and iterative. So 
we, at times, will be iterating on a design, on a sketch, kind of in real time in a meeting with them as a client is saying, oh, no, no, I would like it more like this. Well, okay, no, no, I should move that over there. How's this? So we're trying to get you know, feedback really quickly um, so, that we can, so that we can drive towards what the, the, their real needs are and, and their final kind of approved sketches will be. Um, we also review those sketches internally with uh, the tech lead to make sure that we aren't designing anything too crazy that's gonna cost like way, way more than we actually have in the budget and just make sure that it's doable, that it makes sense. Uh, so we'll, we'll generally do that before sharing them with the client if we're, you know, before uh, uh, the next meeting. So then once we get approval of all those sketches, we move into our next phase. So this is the first of those estimate revisions. So what we do, we have, we kind of stop everything and we tell them, we tell our client we're gonna do our early tech planning now. So we have a series of meetings that include our UX designer, our tech lead, and our PM. We review all of the sketches. So the UX designer kind of walks the tech lead through them. We look at the different features, how things, how things are supposed to work together. Um, at this point, they are just sketches, so all of that isn't like entirely defined. The UX designer probably hasn't had time to speak to the client about all the details yet, but you know we're working with what we have at this point. And so we start to just kind of break it down into really broad tickets. So things like build the home page. You know, nobody, no developer can pick up a ticket that says build the home page and know what to do. That's way too broad. But at this point, we're not trying to. We're not trying to have tickets that are well enough defined that somebody can actually work on them. We're just trying to have tickets that are well enough defined so we can put a very rough estimate on it. So build the home page would be an example of kind of a feature, just a chunk of work that we can kind of conceptualize and say, okay, maybe that's gonna take us 20 hours in this case. Um, we are not trying to, like I said, be very detailed with these estimates. We are not trying to be very accurate. We are just opening broad estimates or broad tickets and providing rough estimates with a goal of being plus or minus 40% the actual time it will take to implement whatever's in that ticket. Um, so we then, so we go through the entire, you know, all of the, the sketches and we list out all these tickets with our big features. And then I take those back to the client in a meeting. So we'll have a meeting where we will review this list of features versus the estimates that we've come to get, that we've come up with. And I, we explain to them, like, this is plus or minus 40%. It's not very accurate, so that's, that's not the point. The point is to get some type of value assigned to each feature so that the client ha then has a better way of assessing, like, is this really something that I want? Because sometimes, you know, this really high priority thing is only maybe $5,000 to implement. And they're like, well, that's great. That's like the most important thing that I needed. That's, you know, a really small part of my budget. And maybe this really trivial feature that they just really added because somebody in, the, you know, in their organization said that they would, it would be nice if, well, maybe that feature is like $40,000 to implement. And they're like, whoa, that is really not that important. Let's get rid of that now. So we're just trying to give them some information, something that they can use to gauge the priority here and, and say, okay, I really need this, I really need this, I'm willing to spend about this much on this and essentially descope things at this point that, that are not necessary so we can fit into, into their budget. So we're trying to help them prioritize by getting rough numbers uh, in, in front of them. So, some of the advantages is that it does kind of give an overview of the feature complexity. The client gets a better idea of what's complex and what isn't. They, you know, they don't know for them. It's probably just as easy to build, you know, an entire events management system as it is like a slideshow. They don't know. Um, so we're trying to show them, okay, feature complexity, dev hours, and cost together in one place. And then it allows them to prioritize early when you know we've only spent a couple hours in meetings and and on sketch design, we haven't done wireframes and interaction requirements and comps, and we haven't you know put together all these tickets, and a developer hasn't worked for 20 hours on this thing yet. Um, so it's really easy to just deprioritize now, before you know they've they've 
eaten up too much of their budget on something that was maybe non-essential. So after, after that initial uh, estimate revision meeting with them, we then, you know, we have our prioritized list of features that we take and we're going to turn into wires. So we go back into, uh, into a series of meetings with our UX designer client PM um, where we are taking those sketches and fleshing them out into complete wireframes with interaction requirements that are explaining exactly how all of the features are going to work and how do they work with one another and how do users interact with them. Uh, so basically, uh, all of the details that are going to help us figure out how to implement it once we get uh, breaking these things down with the development team. Um, once those wires, once we have the complete set of wires, this is also the point in the project where we would start looking at mobile. We generally don't do that in the sketching process unless it's mobile specific or there's like a really specific page that they want to look at at that point. Normally we'd kind of wait for the wires to do the mobile versions. Um, but then once, uh, once all of our wires are, are ready to go and approved, then we would uh, hand them over to our designer and turn them into comps. So he's going to add the look and feeling of the design to the pri to the the design of the site to the wireframes, so that we really have like a full set of PSDs and we know this is you know what each page is going to look like. Once we have client approval of all of that, that's when we do our second revision. So our second revision is our we call it the final tech planning. So we kind of we stop the design process, we've, I mean, at that point, we've designed, we've defined, we're ready to break this down so we can get ready to, to get into development work. Uh, so we do a series of meetings. It generally happens over about a week and a half to two weeks. Um, we include the UX designer, the project manager, the tech lead, um, and two back-end developers, one front-end developer. Um, sometimes it might just be one back end and the front end, depending on the size of the project, what we're looking at. Um, but so we include all those people in a series of meetings. Generally, um, we'll do about two hours per day because they can be kind of long and tedious. So that is why it's spread out over like a week and a half to two weeks. Because if we were to sit there and estimate together for like eight hours a day, we would probably all hate each other at the end of the day. So not a good idea. Um, so what we do is the UX designer then is going to take all of the wires um, and well, all the wires and comps and walk through them with the development team as we did before. At this point, the developers, the back-end developers, the, the front-end developer, they haven't seen these. Only the tech lead knows what's in our wires and comps. So they're kind of fresh on, on the project at that point. They also do not know the estimates that were assigned by the tech lead in our first estimate revision. I erase all of those from JIRA before, before we get in and start doing this work so that it doesn't influence them. Um, so we go, everything, we go over everything in detail. Really lots and lots of detail. <laughs> it can be very boring for me, the PM, when they, sit, when they get into discussing exactly how they're going to implement things and you know, I, which fields do they need and ex all of the modules and how are they going to connect this to that. They get into all of the details of how it's going to happen. Um, sometimes those can, discussions can take quite a while because different people will have different ideas about you know what's the best way to implement something. But uh, we've always we always find that it's really you know fruitful conversation because in the end what we're getting at is the best way to build whatever feature we're we're talking about. Um, so we kind of come to an agreement as to all right how are we going to implement this. Um, all the while taking notes, we're taking very detailed notes that we can then take and pull into all of our tickets so that any developer on our team, when he or she goes to work on that, um, on that feature, they know exactly what was decided. Like, we're going to implement it this way. This is what you need to do. Kind of, here's all the steps. Um, but so once we've come to, to a conclusion as to how to implement, then we kind of do a round of estimation poker. So we go around the room or around the Google Hangout because we're remote, and everybody gives their number. You know, maybe one person says two, and one person is like 10, and one's like 20. Okay, we need to discuss this a little bit more because there's quite a difference there. 
and maybe you know the person who said 20 w really forgot that this other part was going to be done in this other ticket, so we don't really need to estimate that here. But the person who said two, you know, wasn't thinking about this this part of the ticket that we have to implement. And so anyway, we we come to an agreement, uh, just kind of discussing the the estimates that are given in our estimation poker. Um, it's not always the number in the middle. Sometimes you know the lower number, the high number, is the right one, but once we've talked it out, we generally come to an agreement, and that's the number that goes in our ticket. Um, so what we're trying to do here is get to, like our accuracy goal is plus or minus 10% of the actual project hours. So we are trying to be pretty accurate here, and really that's why we spend so much time discussing the details. How are we implementing this? Exactly you know, which modules are we using? How, how is it going to work? Um, so we found that the more detail that we have in our implementation notes, the easier it is to have an accurate estimate because you've taken the time to sit there and figure it out. Like, this is what I need to do so I know how much time it will take because I know what I have to do. <laughs> it's, I'm not just guessing. Um, so at the end of this then, we kind of have our full project architecture laid out. Like we have all of our tickets, we have all of our implementation notes, we have dependencies defined and tickets are you know, tied together in JIRA. Um, so we kind of, everything's there and, and ready to go. We can just kind of get running then on development. Um, so there's also, so the results then of this whole process are actually, they are deliverables for our client. Um, so we have, you know, as I was saying, full tickets with links to the wires and any other relevant docs with a full description of what we're trying to do and you know exactly how, how to implement it. What do we need to do? And then we also have issue mapping with blockers, with dependencies, things that are related. Um, and we generally also define everything uh, in epics. We kind of use ep epics just to categorize our work. I don't think we use it exactly as you're supposed to, but that's how we, we use our epics. Um, so you can look then at the end and see a full feature list with, okay, for search and research, uh, that section of this particular site, it's going to take us 12 hours to build it. These are the four tickets that are involved. Here's the estimates on them. And if you were to click on any of those tickets, you would then get the full implementation details. These are all the steps that we need to do. Here's how it links up. Oh, here's the wire to that. It's all just laid out and ready to go. So for the client, they kind of have they have access to our JIRA, as I said earlier. We don't just let them see time logs in it. They also can see all the tickets and they interact with us in JIRA. Um, so they can see all of this kind of project architecture laid out. And then the other thing that this gives us is a budget breakdown. So what I do at the end of, of this process is I take all of the tickets that we have spent you know, so much time painstakingly <laughs> discussing and, and putting estimates on and I add everything up. So we look at what the total project estimate is after the, our second revision, that's the top number. And then you look at the total number of hours that were available in the original project budget, the total number of hours that have been spent to date, so all of the time that we spent you know, doing our sketches and our wireframing and in client meetings and doing our estimation. Um, and then you, I then the difference would be the hours needed to complete the project. So if you look at your total project estimate minus the, t the total hours spent to date, in this case you need 174 hours to complete the project. So then you can look at your bu budget deficit. Sometimes it's also a surplus. It kind of just depends on how things go. So that would be the hours needed to complete the project minus the total remaining hours in the original project budget. So. I take all of these things and I then present it to our clients in a meeting. So we go through, we go through all these estimate revisions together where we will explain to them, okay, here's our full set of, of features. Essentially that is the scope that we are agreeing to. We're gonna bu build these tickets. Um, and then uh, I review all of those numbers with them so we can look at you know, if maybe there's a concern about one area that's costing more than they thought, we can go back to the ticket and look at why. You know, this is, they still have time at this point to deprioritize any of their, t any of those tickets if there's issues with them being over budget. But, so I spend the time in this meeting to explain everything to them. How did we get to these numbers? Exactly what's going into them? What are the tickets? 
um, and what is it? What is the impact on their on their on their total project budget? Um, so then, before we go into this client meeting, we do actually talk internally about our recommendations. So if they're over budget, we try to come to them with some with some options. So you know maybe if they descope items, you know X, Y, and Z, they can just do those in a, in, a, in a further phase. It's really not that big of an impact on the site. They were nice to haves anyway. Not such a big deal. Um, maybe we divide development work between the client. Uh, maybe the client has an internal team and you know they can take on a little bit of the development work and we take on most of it. We've done that before actually quite su successfully and the client ended up being really happy to kind of get a chance to learn from our developers in a sense and get some, some hands-on training and, and contribute to their own project. Um, or there's also been cases where, okay, we need all these things, they're all a priority, um, and so the client actually has some more budget that they're able to allocate you know, from maybe a di different line item in their budget, maybe they're able to kind of move some funds from next year, maybe they always had more budget and they never told you. Yeah, there's different, different ways um, that sometimes more budget can be found if, if they really do need all of these items in the scope. Um, but essentially, you know, what we're trying to do is empower them and allow the client to be making these decisions and not come to them when we're, you know, a couple of weeks from launch and there's a couple of key features that aren't yet built and tell them, we're out of budget, sorry. We're allowing them to make these decisions and to be aware of the actual cost to build this project before we start building it. So, you may be thinking, what? You get clients to pay for all this estimating? That's crazy. Uh, you may think it's totally surprising, but this process is essentially all technical planning. Uh, it's time that we spend upfront defining the project so that once we get into development, things generally go very smoothly. Everything is set up. We kind of have you know, figured out how to implement these things. We've talked about all of our different options, so we don't tend to get, we, we don't have these really like nebulous huge tickets that a developer takes and then he's like, oh, I don't know how to build this and he starts here and maybe he gets down some rabbit hole and then he like goes on to this other option. We've already talked about all the options and decided what the best way to go was. So we reduce some of that time that may be logged on the ticket if you were doing it, if you weren't following our process and doing it, you know, just kind of, here's these big tickets and they're not really defined and go figure it out. The time to figure out how to build something is going to get spent, whether it's by a loan developer who's been given a really, you know, big ticket and doesn't know what to do with it, or by an entire team trying to figure it out together in discussions. So, you know, what it is, it, it's not just estimating, it's technical planning, it's defining the project and, and kind of getting everything ready so that we can just get going and, and get working. Um, it, so it does, we found that it saves a lot of time on actual development. Um, and we also don't get into situations where we need to, where we've built something and then we need to stop and like rebuild it because we didn't, you know, plan out the entire architecture, think about how it related to this other feature. Um, we don't have to like scrap our work and, and start over again. So uh, once we get, you know, once we get into then development after that second uh, revision meeting with the client and you know, we come to them with their options and they're going to tell us, okay, I approve this final scope, I approve, you know, this budget, we're ready to get going. And at that point we just get into more of an agile development process. I know you're probably thinking, but what, this sounds so much like waterfall, you guys plan everything up front, it's not agile. I totally admit that it's not agile at first, but we kind of try to make it agile once we get into, into development. So at that point, like, we have defined everything, we have estimated everything, but we're going to be defining sprints based on you know what they need to get out the door first. And working in those two week sprints, we have pretty accurate estimates, so we know what we can you know actually take on in any given sprint. And we are not we are we generally run our projects as time and materials, so we are not we don't come back to the client and say, oh, well, you want this new feature? Well, that wasn't in our scope. We didn't talk about that. That wasn't in our wires. Like, we'll just open the ticket, discuss it, put an estimate on it, and add it in. And either it increases the budget because it's a new, you know, request, or they remove something. 
Um, so we are flexible. It's not as, as, as rigid as like an actual waterfall process would be. We're flexible once we get into development. We can have change to, to our scope, um, but we just have to be and are very upfront with the client about what that means. <laughs> what does that mean to your budget? What does that mean to your timeline? If you're adding this new thing, sorry, but I probably can't get it done you know, within the same timeline and within the same budget if we don't remove something else. So there's just trade-offs and they have to be aware of those and we try to empower them to make those decisions on their own. We cannot decide for them because it's not our money and it's not our project and we don't have to deal with this to, to live with whatever the final product is once the project is done. You know, that's, it's, it's their baby. So they get to tell us what they want to do with it. Um, so one thing that we do though is, uh, I said this much earlier that we do do weekly, you know, meetings with our clients uh, once we're in development, where we're going to be giving, uh, you know, as, uh, budget updates and going over progress and, and status. And we demo. We try to do it weekly. Sometimes it's just at the end of each sprint, so bi-weekly just kind of depends on how much we got done. Clients are generally excited to see your progress, so if we can do more demos, we found that that's better. And also, that gives you earlier, quicker feedback, so that you can uh, make any changes that are needed. And then um, as we wrap the project, we've generally found that our estimates are pretty accurate. We do end up more, you know, at within our uh, plus or minus 10% that we defined. Um, I've never gone and done like a, a detailed analysis like ticket by ticket because in the end it kind of evens out. You know, plus or minus 10% means maybe this one was 10 over, maybe it was 15 over, but maybe this other one was 15 under and it ends up kind of evening out. We're just worried about kind of the total project budget at this point. Um, and what we found is, you know, our clients are a lot happier. They get their MVP. Um, they're within their budget and they were informed throughout the process. It wasn't just like, you know, this really dark process where, you know, we were kind of hiding behind the curtain and doing our thing and then we like showed them this finished site. They were involved. They got to prioritize. They got to you know, know what we we're doing at all points throughout the process, and they could change things if they needed to, and you know, were empowered to make decisions about their budget and about their scope on their own. Um, and then the other cool thing is, if we did wires or sketches for some features that they were thinking were pretty nice to have, but ended up descoping, well, we kind of have phase two then lined up because we already have some of what we need to get started on that next round of features. We already know what the next things are that they want to do. So you can just kind of, you know, once they have more budget available and are ready to do a phase two, you're ready to get started on it. So there are some instances where the project, where this process doesn't really work or the full process in any case. Um, so sometimes clients come to you with UX. They've already done it, they didn't use another firm or whatever. Um, but in that case, you don't really go through the full discovery process. Um, in a case like that, what we would probably do is um, do a couple of initial meetings to kind of review all of this UX with them. Like, you know, what are these wires? How are they working? Because that can be a little bit difficult to fully understand when you yourselves didn't, did not do them. And then we would kind of just jump into our second uh, our second estimation round where, okay, like if this is all good and we understand how everything's supposed to work and you know, we don't have any recommendations for changes, then let's just start estimating this. We'll break it down. How are we going to implement it and just hop right into that part of our process. Um, and then if it's really, really a time and materials project, which I did say that we are time and materials. That is true. It's in, you know, generally in our, our, our client agreements. Um, but most of our clients still do have a budget in mind that they're working towards, so it's you're kind of working with both. If you're in a situation though where it's pure time and materials, they don't really have a budget, doesn't really matter to them, it's more maybe a retainer engagement or something like that, then you don't really need to bother with this full process. You can kind of do a, a condensed version of it where, you know, as a new feature is is uh, defined, you maybe have just like a quick meeting with your tech lead and uh, you know, and a dev and, and your UX person to break down this feature and estimate just that one feature and a couple tickets and then you can just you know, talk to the client about, okay, well this is about how many hours, this is about how long it will take us to implement it, do we move forward? You don't need to do the full process that I've described here. Um, some of the disadvantages. This process requires client buy-in. 
if your client doesn't get this, doesn't understand why their pro why their budget may need to be revised, why you don't, why you can't possibly accurately estimate, you know, a two hundred thousand dollar project based off of a bullet listed RFP, then it's probably not a good fit for this process, and you shouldn't try to run this process with that client. Um, and you know, as I said, this is something that we kind of sell from the very beginning. This is part of our sales process. We're explaining like, this is what we do. This is how we run our projects. This, these are the advantages to you. But if it's not a fit, it's not a fit. You know, you just sometimes, some, some agencies and some clients just are, are not good cultural fits and they shouldn't work together. But, so definitely need the client to buy into it. Um, the, uh, some of the other disadvantages, so the technical planning meetings can be difficult to schedule. It requires a lot of people and it's like, you know, one and a half to two weeks of two hours every day. That can be hard to fit into a schedule. I try to do it as, you know, early as I can. Uh, that doesn't always mean that things don't get moved, you know, things come up, but that can be a little bit of, of a difficult part in this process. And then the meetings are really very long and tedious. I think even for the developers, I think they're definitely way more excited about talking about these things and figuring out how to implement it. Um, but it, it's draining on them too, right? It's a lot of working things out and discussing it. And so um, we're trying to improve our efficiency there. And it's kind of a work in progress. I'm just telling you what we do now and hopefully in the future we'll find a way to condense the process a little bit more and maybe make it a little bit faster so that we like just instantly have you know, all of our implementation details. We'll see, I will, I will tell you if, if uh, we make that happen. Um, so yeah, that's kind of all that I was going to say to you today. Um, thank you very much for coming and listening to my talk about our estimation process. I'm open for questions. If you have a question though, can I please ask you to come to the microphone because uh, this is recorded and they won't hear you otherwise. Yeah. And are your slides up? Uh, they are not yet, but I will put them up. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, my big question is, who's paying for all of the time that you're spending in these estimate phases? Is that you guys, or are you billing the client to re-estimate mm -hmm. your projects within it? Yes, so um, that was something that I touched on earlier, that we, we do bill our time for the estimations, because oh. it's not just estimating. We're doing technical planning. These are, you know, it's important uh, part of planning out their projects so that it runs smoothly. So you mentioned uh, there can be difficulty with client buy-in, but when you kind of unveiled this new process to uh, the employees, did you have any, any struggle getting staff buy-in, and how did you overcome that? You know, I don't think that we did, because it was something that we kind of discussed together. Like, we were coming from, coming off of a project that, you know, the end result wasn't great. We were all kind of frustrated by it, so we discussed it, and then there was the idea to, to do these two breakdowns came from one person in the team. It wasn't really like this joint conclusion that we came to, but when he brought that to us and explained it, we were like, okay, like, let, let's try that. Let's see if this works. And when, when we did and we saw the results that it brought to the you know, subsequent project, we were like, well, this is cool. Let's keep doing that. And we've tried to refine it a little bit um, over time. But uh, yeah, it wasn't, it is, the people who were part of the team at the time when we started this process all immediately bought into it. There have been some new additions to our team who have been like, what is this process? What are you guys doing? Who don't really get it until they've done it and then they like it. <laughs> so it can be a little bit more difficult to get the buy-in from new hires, I guess, uh, who are coming into the team. But essentially, once they've done it, they get it. And if they don't, then we can talk about that and figure it out together. You know, maybe they have ideas for how to improve it. We're always open to that, so. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, first, great, great talk, learned Thanks. a lot. I don't think, as an audience, we've applauded you yet, so. Oh. We'll do that. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so my question is, with your early tech planning and your late tech planning, mm -hmm. you know, you have your tickets, you show them to the client, and you'd be like, you know, homepage is going to take 12 hours. If mm -hmm. the client isn't happy with that, how do you deal with when they say, oh, just take out this one item, but it's maybe a core piece that you really need in there? Like mm -hmm. if they just cherry pick what they want to get rid of to reduce hours. 
So when we're doing our the first when we're doing the first revision, we try to steer them away from that type of cherry picking because the estimates are very rough at that point. So it really is cherry picking isn't going to get them to the result that they want. You know, removing like a banner or something or like the the slider on this page, that's not going to, you know, reduce their budget by $50,000 if that's how over they are. They need to get a little bit more serious about like maybe we don't need this section of our site. Maybe we don't need and and so those are conversations that you just have to have with them just be really upfront and say, "Hey, like we can do this if you want to. It's not going to be very fun and it's really not going to get you the result that you want." So maybe it would be better to take a hard look at some of these, you know, bigger features where the money is actually being spent. Um, and then when we get into tier two, uh, tier two, sorry, that's our second one. That's kind of our internal word for it. Um, when we get into the final uh, revision, at that point, it's generally okay if they do want to cherry pick um, because the estimates are pretty accurate. So if they cherry pick enough, they might get to the, to the end result that they need for their budget. Um, but if it's something where we're like, that's really a key feature that you should keep, then we'll discuss that with them and maybe try and find something else that can be de deprioritized. Um, and at that point too, if they are just cherry picking, since they're much smaller tickets, there are things that you can, you can always say, look, once we get this launched, if you then have some budget available for like maintenance or whatever, maybe you have, you know, maybe we're going to, we'll talk about like a 40 hour per month maintenance rider or something like that. Well, those are small, small improvements that we can be making after that point. You know, the site isn't static. It's not going to go live and then never have any changes to it. So maybe some of those things that were cherry picked can get worked on later. Makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Again, great job. That was awesome. Um, I would assume though at the, um, before you get to the point where you can kick off tier one, tier two estimates, you mm -hmm. had to give the client a number to win the work to get to that point. How much effort are you putting into that stage of it where it is all non-billable time? It's not non-billable. It's not. Before yeah, before you win. Before you win. Oh, before, uh, yeah. like the proposal part? Yeah. Because oh, it, okay. Because well, some that, point you had to have a number that was yes. close to get to that point. The work <laughs> that we do to get to the, the initial proposal, yes, that is non-billable. Um, well, I mean, that's kind of why you have margins, is yep. so that you know you can absorb some of the, your operating costs like that. Um, but the non-billable time spent there, it's generally the sales team who we wouldn't expect to be billable anyway, and then maybe maybe like five hours of time from you know tech lead and, and a UX person. Maybe they've had a meeting or two with the client just so that they get to know them. Um, Maybe you know they've been discussing with the salesperson trying to pull to get together the numbers. I, I'm five hours is an absolute guess. I don't know. It also depends on how big this project is, what we're trying you know to to respond to as far as an RFP, how big the proposal is. Um, but yeah, it would essentially be that's just going to be absorbed in our margins. Okay. Um, and but once once it is signed, once we get into kickoff, everything from that point forward is billable. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So I've got a question about getting the client buy-in because mm -hmm. when you guys first brought this on board, you probably had a different model in which you were working with your clients. So how did you, you know, you probably already had outstanding contracts and whatnot. Yeah. How did you deal with that? Like getting these clients to come on board to a whole new process that yeah. probably to them looked like it would cost them way more money. So the first, our, our Contracts were always uh, like time and materials, so that part was always kind of clear that mm, it's kind of going to cost what it costs for time and materials. We're not saying it will only cost you whatever this dollar amount is. So that part was kind of already taken care of contractually. The first client that we did this with was actually UCLA Library, and they are just awesome people to work with, and they got it. So we explained the process to them. We explained, like, we're going to try this out. Um, this is going to allow you to really get you know, the features that you want because we're gonna prioritize them. You know, you'll be able to prioritize them. You'll see real you know, value for each feature. And they got it. They were actually one of the clients who, um, when they ended up being over budget after the initial, uh, after our second revision, um, we ended up working with one of their developers for a little while and you know, we were able to get them all of their features um, within their, their budget because of that, and we just made it work together. So 
I don't know if we just lucked out <laughs> with with that situation, but but it definitely worked. They they got it. Um, maybe if we'd had a ton of resistance from like our first you know guinea pig client on it, we maybe we would have waited for the next one. I don't I don't know because they were cool about it. So. Thank you, and yeah. yeah, I agree with that previous person. This was a really good talk. Thank you Thanks. very much. Thank you. Hi, so my question is when and how do you estimate your project manager time? I saw your budget breakdown, which was really cool. Mm -hmm. Are you doing just a percentage of the overall work? or Because it sounds like you're just adding up whatever's a ticket, so. Yes, so we have changed that actually recently. What used to happen is I would add a percentage um, to of like total dev time, um, but when I'm, you have to keep in mind that when I'm adding up those final numbers, there's a certain amount of time that's already been spent mm -hmm. on, you know, uh, on design and definition, and the project manager has been in most of those meetings, has been coordinating that whole time. So, what I would do with those tickets is I would essentially, so we have like a general meetings ticket, right? We have a general PM ticket. So I would look at how much time had already been spent and logged, and then the estimate was that, plus how much, how much time I needed to get to the end of the project, because obviously if we've already spent, you know, 20 hours in meetings, if I have a 30 hour, you know, meeting ticket to get me through the end of the project, I'm gonna go over. So I would take into account what was already spent and then estimate kind of based on that and what was needed to finish. Um, we've actually uh, stopped though billing our project management time on an hourly basis and have just started applying a flat 20% Okay. Yeah. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. Um, I was really curious about um, sort of product ownership and where that lies. Do you drive your client to sort of hold the vision of what their product is going to look like, or do you help yeah. guide them in that way? We drive the client to be their product owner because it's, you know, I, I said earlier it's their baby. Like, they're the ones who have to live with this final project. Product. It's not a project manager on our end. You know, it's it's their site. So we try to find um, you know, a stakeholder from, uh, from their organization who can be that product owner. Um, sometimes they need some help and the project manager can be there to help guide them. Um, our project managers kind of also work as account managers, so we're really trying to build relationships with these people. And we want to work with them on a long-term basis. So, you know, if they need a little bit of a little a little bit of coaching, a little bit of oh, okay, so here's how product ownership works. Like these are some of the things that you're going to have to do internally. We'll help get them through that process. We want it to be, you know, a successful and and enjoyable as enjoyable as possible <laughs> uh, process for them. So, thank you. Yeah. Hi, do you uh, build in any more budget check meetings throughout or do you do it at like every sprint review or how do you, how do you keep them apprised of the budget throughout the entire course of the project? Yeah, once we get in development, um, so we would do those weekly like status updates with our client and we would always go through the budget at that point. Okay. Do you track so your time in JIRA or, or where they can see it live or do yes. you do it? Okay. Yeah, all of our time is in JIRA. Okay. Besides now that PM time since, as I said, we've right. started just adding that as a 20% percentage. Cool, yeah. thank you. Um, I have found that in some, for some projects when things are super complicated, the developers or the tech leads need just extra time to figure out what modules they're going to use, so they don't really know exactly how they're going to build something. Mm -hmm. At what point then in your process are they doing that figuring? Do they take time up front during the estimation, or is yes. it a wider estimate and they're doing that in dev? Yes, so they would take time when we're doing our second revision. That's when we're gonna have a couple of developers together discussing each feature and really figuring out what module, and that's why the meetings are so long, because they may be, maybe they're you know, weighing two different modules and maybe like they're looking, you know, they're out looking on Drupal.org like, okay, what exactly is in this module? Who's used it? Is it maintained? You know, looking at their different options. Um, so, yeah, they'll really be going through all of those things in our estimation process and getting all those details in the ticket. That doesn't mean that there's never a case when that doesn't change once we get into it. Maybe we do get into it and we're like, oh, that wasn't the best option. We can revise that, it's okay. Um, well, we may need to change the estimate as a result, discuss it with the client, you know, that's the type of thing where the, where the transparency comes into play, where maybe we'll say, look, we thought we could use this module, but as it turns out, like, they're not gonna be maintaining it anymore, or it doesn't do this thing that we thought it did, so we're gonna have to change it, it has this effect, and you know, just let them, let them know, let them also decide, you know, w where they wanna go with it, what the impact is, yeah. Great talk, thank Thanks. you. 
How do you deal or at what point in the estimating process do you handle things that you may not really know yet, like uh, demos for UX uh, testing, for example, before we move into the full uh, development process or design rounds on the uh, front end? So, well, <laughs> the design and discovery part, we, nah. I guess when we get into our tier one, Normally, what, what I would do at that first revision is I ask my UX designer, you know, he's been working with the client at that point for a little while, so I ask, okay, how long do you think it's going to take you to get through the wires? And so we do, we do the kind of the same thing that I was talking about for the, the project management or the meeting tickets where I look at how much time was spent, and then I'm going to add to that how much time he thinks is needed to complete. Um, so I kind of get the, the designer, the UX designer, and the UI designer to give me some numbers around that stuff. Um, I also generally will have a ticket where I add a couple of hours for uh, design reviews so that once things are, are uh, themed, he, the, the, the UX designer can come back in and take a look and you know, review everything. And I also will have like QA tickets and things like that where I put a percentage you know, so we can be going through um, so we can be going through QA testing and also that would include some time for revisions when like bugs come out of things. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, I can I can take more time but just it can't I we have to get packing packing up. <laughs> so